So uh, we just looked at the x, y component there, but we could look at the, you know, if we had a third dimension, we could look at the y, z and whatnot. And so ultimately, you, just like the stress tensor has nine components, you would get uh, a strain tensor that has nine components. And here they've been labeled one, two, three, but you can just think of um, one is x, two is y, and three is z. But if you, if you label them one, two, three, it allows us to write the thing more compactly. Uh, and so if we, if we write it, we can write it using the one, two, three labeling, we can write it very compactly like this. So ep, any component, epsilon ij, is equal to one half uh, partial ui partial xj partial uj partial xi for i goes from 1 to 3 and j goes to 1 to 3. And this is why the 2 becomes convenient, because if the 2 wasn't there, uh, it wouldn't work for the shear strain component. So let's, you know, let's just pick um, an i and a j and see what happens. So if we pick i equals to 1, j equals to 1, um, we get, you know, epsilon 1, 1 is equal to 1 half partial u1 partial x1 plus partial u1 partial x1, that's equal to 1 half 2 partial u1 partial x1, which is equal to partial u1 partial x1. And in the, you know, then in the, you know, transforming it back to Cartesian lingo, right, where 1 is x, 2 is y, 3 is z, this is just partial u x, partial x. Right? And so that's what we had for our normal strain, right? The x, the x normal strain was that guy. Likewise, if we say i equals 1, j equals 2, then what you'd get is transforming it back to x, y, z, then you have that. And so that's why we labeled, that's why we, when we went to investigate the shear strain, that's why we put a 2 over there, so that we could write this compact formula later. Works out. No, no, no. Uh, I just uh, I, I erased the uh, details. What, what I said was you could work through the same logic. So for beta, I just wrote the final result. But the the logic to get to that final result it involves the same logic as alpha. So you'd take the tangent and make those simplifications. So I just wrote down the final result without showing the details. Okay. That's why it looks simpler. Are you, are you no, but I mean by definition, the, the we're saying that these strains are small okay. yeah. under these sort of geometric constraints. There is, I mean, there is a theory for large strains. Um, uh, wonder, wonder if I can find this quickly. Um, um, give me just a second.
Okay, so there's our little unit cube. This is what I'm calling the linear strain right here is the strain that we just defined. In, in this case, we're just looking at a plane, so there's only four components, right? I don't have a third dimension. It's just the 2D strain. And here, so here's our little unit cube with no strain. And I'm gonna I'm gonna strain it up there at the top. So I, I applied some strain and this is the computed strain tensor from that shape. Okay. And there's also something here called the green strain. So this is a uh, this is something you'd learn about in, in, in graduate continuum mechanics. But the green strain is is valid for finite deformations, large deformations. And when the deformations are small, they're almost the same. So even here they're not uh, they're only different in the in the second decimal place, right? Um, if I make the deformations smaller, they would be even less different, right? If the deformations are really small, they're they're pretty close to one another, right? The two strains. By the way, remember when we first started talking about strain, you know, we just said strain is like some change in length normalized by some length. And so there's actually an infinite number of strains we can define. It's just this linear strain is the one that makes the most sense geometrically when we sort of go through the, the workings of the geometry for small for small angles. Okay. But here's the curiosity and the reason for showing this, I guess. Um, you remember sh strain has to do with uh, change in shape and volume of a, of a material, right? Uh, so if I have a valid strain measure and I, I've changed the shape and, and volume of the material, but then I translate it or rotate it, I'm not straining it anymore. So in other words, if I take that shape there and I hold it fixed, I haven't strained it anymore, and then I begin to rotate. I shouldn't change the strain because I'm not straining. I'm not, I'm not deforming it anymore. But look what happens to the small strain when I rotate this thing. Changes. So basically, it's not valid under large rotations. So it's a it's a simple model that works good for small or zero rotations, but will not work. Uh, and it's important to understand the the, the sort of difference between um, you know large strain and large deformation or large rotation because I can have a very small strain but a very large deformation, believe it or not. And one example would be if I had a very, very long slender beam. Imagine, imagine I'm, you know, holding a, a well, like a, maybe like a ruler, you know, like a, like a long like yardstick type ruler uh, made out of wood or, or uh, possibly metal. Um, if you were to say stick a strain gauge on that beam, on that ruler, and say, say I wish I had one, you know, imagine I clamped one end of the ruler here, and it's a yardstick, so it sticks out to here, right? If I were to stick a strain gauge on that thing and I push on it and bend it, the strain would be very, very small. I'm not actually, the change in length per unit length, if you will, is small. And it would, it would be very, very small strains. But however, just visually, you'd see the deformation is large because there's a lot of rotation. And so that's not, this is a complete aside from this class, but since you asked the question, uh, this would be something you would consider in a graduate class in continuum mechanics or something like that, large deformation. So the, the strain that, that we were talking about is, is, you know, we call it the small strain or the linear strain. It's, it's geometrically linear. And, uh, and, it, and it, yeah, so, because it, the, the idea of linear comes from when we, when we strained it and we, and we wrote down, you know, that this distance here is like uh, partial UY, partial X, DX, uh, that comes from, that term comes from a Taylor series expansion of the, um, of the, def, of the deformation field. 
And, and we're only, that's only the first term. There would be higher order terms that we're ignoring that are on the order of dx squared. Right? So the word linear comes from the fact that the, the terms that we keep in, from the Taylor series expansion are, are the linear terms in dx, the distance there. So anyway, um, another clever visualization that uh, if you can, I think this probably took a l I don't have the code here. One, uh, one kind of cool thing about Mathematica is you can, you can write, um, you know, so like for in this example I showed you earlier, where you can see the code there. I can then export this as what's called a CDF, computable document format. And then I can send that to someone who doesn't have Mathematica. Mathematica is a paid software. So, I mean, we have it on the, the uh, College of Engineering desktop here. You don't have to pay for it, but uh, you know, otherwise you'd have to pay for it. But what you can do is you can create these little animate, these little visualizations, or in this case, you know, it's sort of a little uh, widget. Uh, and this is what I used to create. Um, this was several years ago before uh, the Jupyter Notebook had these widget functionality. So you know, I, I give you this rotation. And I did that because I can do that all with open source free software. Um, but, it, but before they had that functionality, I would have done it in Mathematica. And that's what I did here. And then you can, I can distribute this. And you do have to download a free little CDF viewer, from, sort of like a PDF viewer, if you will. Uh, from from Wolfram's website, and then you could actually play with this uh, without having the actual source code available or having Mathematica installed. So anyway, okay. So um, we define our strain tensor, and uh, just to remind you, also like what we're trying to do here is we're trying to we're trying to close the problem of conservation of momentum. Remember. We, we have a conservation of momentum equation which uh, relates displacements and has this divergence of stress term in it. And we're trying to get that, we're trying to get a relationship between stress and displacement. Right? And the intermediate quantity we use is strain. Right? So strain is a function of displacement. Then if we have a relationship between stress and strain, we can close that problem. We can get everything back in terms of displacements that we can solve. 